Hello everyone, welcome back to week four of our lectures for Physical Geography 101 uh, Earth Systems. We're going to continue today talking about karst. These are landscapes and topography formed from limestone. And we'll see throughout this lecture that these types of landscapes are um, constantly changing and uh, pose a number of different risks to society. Uh, so knowing how they form and how they might change is def definitely important for understanding our relationship with the natural world. So karst topography, like this one that you can see here, um, is just a landscape formed from the dissolution of limestone or dolomite. So limestone is um, rock formed from calcite, uh, calcium carbonate that we talked about, and then dolomite is just um, calcite with a bit more magnesium in it. And so you can see an example of a, a limestone rock. And um, the important thing about these is that they can dissolve, as we've talked about with ocean acidification and um, in soils, the reaction between carbon dioxide and water um, that you can see here um, can form carbonic acid. Um, and the more carbonic acid, the more CO2 that's dissolved in the water, then the more easily that um, calcite, such as the shells that um, animals use for their exoskeletons, can dissolve. Um, and so the, this calcite dissolves um, and the limestone that, uh, that they're made out of uh, can get eroded away. Um, so when rainwater, uh, and especially acidic rainwater, um, flow over limestone deposits on land, um, then we can get really intricate um, landforms, um, such as caves and caverns and all sorts of stuff that we're going to be talking about. You can see a map here with, um, that, with all the uh, blue areas indicating carbonate rocks. Um, importantly, you can see here that um, a good portion of the United States and the Yucatan Peninsula, as well as um, broad swaths of China um, and Asia, also have um, very large areas with karst topography that we'll, we'll look into a bit more. Um, if we zoom into the United States, we can see here that all of Florida, pretty much, as well as southern Georgia, is covered in... Um, carbonate rocks, some of it which is exposed and some of it which is, is buried. Um, additionally, you have a large amount of the Midwest that has carbonate rocks. Um, and that this has led to some of these areas having some of the largest um, cave systems in the United States. And so as um, a carbonate layer um, is exposed to rain um, and dissolves away, it can form a number of different um, landscape features from um, towers like these um, to uh, less mature features, um, such as dolines and uvula that we'll be talking about um, in a little bit. Um, but you can see here the progression from this flat um, layer that starts to get eroded away and forming into these dif different features. So first, let's talk about caves. So you can see I'm there on the left uh, exploring a cave in New Zealand. New Zealand has a lot of really interesting cave formations. Um, one of the most interesting things about them is that a lot of the caves have glow, warm, glow worms. So these are worms that um, they have special bacteria in their gut, um, which glows a beautiful blue color, kind of makes the ceiling of the cave look like a starry night. I highly recommend um, you check it out if you ever have the chance. Um, so what's the difference between a cave and a cavern? So a cavern is just a specific type of cave which is formed from the dissolution of rock. So when we talk about um, limestone caves, those are usually caverns because they're formed from um, that limestone dissolving away as water moves through it. 
So within these caves, um, we have a lot of different speleothems. So speleothems are just different features formed by the dissolution uh, and deposition of uh, carbonates within the cave system. Uh, and you can see them here, and we'll go through each of them. So the first is uh, stalactites. So stalactites form when you have water seeping into a cave system from the ceiling uh, and dripping down. And as it drips, then the um, calcite that's dissolved in that water um, gets deposited in this um, kind of dripping uh, form here. Uh, I like to think of it as stalactites, tights hang down, uh, and so um, stalactites always form on the ceiling and hang down as they approach the, the cave floor. Next, we have stalagmites. Mites are on the ground, and st so stalagmites um, form from the ground up. Um, they uh, get deposited as you have a drip in a cave that um, always consistently drips in one spot, and as it does and it hits the ground, then some of that calcite that's dissolved in that water um, gets deposited, um, and you can start to build up a higher and higher um, uh, structure, just like this one. Um, and a spatter mite uh, is very similar, except um, it's usually falling from a higher distance, and so that water and to spatter out and can form these um, kind of concentric discs. Um, but the important thing is stalagmites always form from the, the ground up as, as that um, carbonate is being deposited. Um, so sometimes stalactites and stalagmites merge together, and when they do, they form a column. So a column is a uh, vertical uh, feature in a cave that extends from the floor all the way up to the ceiling as these two systems have, have combined together. And you can see a few examples of them, them here. They can be quite large. Um, next we have drapes. Um, so whenever you have, uh, instead of a single point where um, that water is dripping down um, and depositing calcite, and instead, have a linear feature, such as a fracture or a crack in the rock, sometimes you can have drapes. So these are these beautiful um, kind of wavy structures that develop as water seeps through a linear crack. Uh, and so as it comes down, this whole um, linear feature starts to have um, this drape formation form that can be um, curved due to different water um, or air currents in the cave or um, just the shape of that crack. Next we have flow stones. So as a um, maybe a waterfall or just a, a flow of water um, in a cave moves over an object, it can deposit um, limestone onto that object and it can kind of look like a frozen waterfall or the smooth limestone feature um, as water flows over it continuously and deposits. Uh, and these can take a number of different shapes that you can see here. Um, they're usually quite large um, and can develop as you have water flowing from one location to the next. Next is a really cool feature, uh, soda straws. So soda straws are a lot like stalactites um, but stalactites have water dripping down um, that uh, deposit uh, on the outside, whereas soda straws are only one drop in width in their hollow. And so water flows down the center of the soda straw, um, and as it reaches the end and kind of sits there, then, it, then some of that calcite within that drop um, deposits out. And so you have this um, vertical straw that comes down from the ceiling um, and can extend quite a long ways. And they tend to be extremely fragile. Um, and if 
at any point you have that straw being blocked, sometimes they form into stalactites because they can no, no longer flow through the center of that formation and instead have to flow through the outside. So those are soda straws. Next, we have helictites. Um, so these are very strange systems um, that are still being studied for how they form. So helictites are kind of like um, stalactites, except that they form in random directions. Um, you can see here they're kind of like hair-like and kind of go all over the place instead of straight down. And sometimes they can defy gravity completely and just form upwards, even though the water is seeping down um, below them. And so um, helictites uh, form when you have water coming out of the rock um, and depositing that calcite, um, but something clogs up the hole that it's coming out of and a new hole forms. Um, maybe it's a, a crystal that gets deposited and um, causes a, a blockage. Um, and that new hole forms and water seeps out in the new direction um, and capillary forces pull that water in that new direction. And that can happen multiple different times in kind of a, in a curve pattern sometimes. Um, additionally, if you have different wind currents that are causing um, water to be forced into one direction, then you can have these curve features as well. Um, they're, they're definitely a complex system formed um, by um, water moving in somewhat unpredictable manners. Next, we have sinter terraces, like you can see here. Sometimes when um, water flows down through a cave, um, it can form into a pond or a puddle, um, and you have calcite developing and depositing on the edge of that, that puddle. Um, and it forms a, a terrace feature, and that the walls of that puddle will build up as more and more um, limestone gets deposited um, until you have water, um, enough water to come in to flow over. And so you start to get these multiple terraces that deposit um, as you have calcite forming these um, more mature puddle formations. Next, we have frost work. So frost work is a very cool feature that um, can occur inside of a cave. It's these very delicate kind of coral-like features um, that can be seen in a cave. And these are formed um, instead of water coming out of um, the cave wall, it can form when you have a lot of water vapor in the air of the cave that has a lot of calcite dissolved into that water vapor. Um, and so as the water vapor then touches some sort of structure, such as um, uh, these structures here, um, then you can have that um, water vapor depositing calcite um, from the air. Uh, and the evaporation rate has a big effect on that. Um, and so, the amount of, um, of these frost works that develop depend on the concentration of calcite um, in the water vapor and the air. Uh, you can kind of think of these as the um, hoarfrost or rime ice that we talked about earlier. When you have frost in the air and water vapor um, that's freezing onto a surface, it's a very similar process just um, with calcite being deposited instead of ice crystals. Next, we have box work. So box work is very similar to um, drapery uh, or cave drapes, um, except that um, instead of single linear features, you have a whole network of them. So you have a series of cracks that develop on the ceiling of a cave, um, and then uh, water flows down through those cracks uh, and form these uh, box-like features uh, linear features that are interlinked with each other um, that tend to erode less easily than the parent rock. And so as you have more deposition occurring, forming these linear features, and you also have erosion of the area between them, and you can have these 
kind of very deep, um, intricate systems of, of um, d deposits. Next, we have pop uh, cave popcorn. So really cool uh, features that can develop um, in a cave, uh, also called uh, coralloids because they kind of look like coral. Uh, there's a number of different types. There's spiky or button, round or blob. Um, so these are uh, different features that form in caves as water seeps out of the rock with a lot of um, calcite dissolved in that water. But unlike these other features, they usually form when water is flowing over them as well. And so when you have a lot of water flowing, that water can round um, those features instead of kind of more delicate, intricate systems um, that faster water flow tends to round them and, and make them more hydrodynamic, you can see here. Um, sometimes those cave popcorns can come off the wall and form uh, on the cave floor. And as they do, they can roll around. And as they roll, they can gather more of that limestone layers and form cave pearls or ooids. Um, so they, they start to form layers and they grow larger and larger. And a lot of times they'll, they'll form into these divots. Um, and so you'll have these perfectly round balls of calcite that develop as fast flowing water moves over them and causes them to roll around and, and have that calcite layer um, deposit onto it evenly instead of on one side. So those are speleotherms, or speleothems. Um, so besides speleothems, um, caves can form some intricate patterns um, based off of their kind of large scale structure. Uh, and these can look very similar to river systems um, above ground, such as the uh, curvilinear uh, branchwork pattern, which is very similar to a dendritic river system that we'll talk about more with, with rivers. And then a rectilinear branchwork system um, where you have these 90 degree angles that often form because the rock is highly fractured and the river flow follows these fracture paths. You have anastomosing maze uh, patterns where you have rivers that are meeting up with each other and then dividing apart um, over and over again. You have network ma mazes, um, which again are in highly fractured systems. You have sponge work mazes, which are kind of random and all over the place um, where you have very high porosity rock um, and there's not much structure to it at all. And then you have ramiform patterns, um, which form very large rooms, uh, cave rooms um, that are connected by different stream systems. Um, and these form when you have uh, highly erodible um, rock that can form these large rooms. So the largest of the caves um, is Han Sung Dung um, in Vietnam. Uh, so this is a truly massive cave system over three miles long underground, uh, as well as over 36 million square meter or cubic meters um, as you move down underground. Um, so caves can get extremely large um, and they can form um, truly massive structures. So they're, they're definitely a force to be reckoned with. Um, one of those reasons is because of sinkholes. Sometimes caves collapse. Uh, and as a result, the void space that they um, that forms can swallow up entire houses or cars, as you can see here. Um, so a sinkhole is just a cavity in the ground formed by dissolution or erosion uh, of the underlying bedrock or soil. And you can see an example of one here. You'll notice that there's a lot of um, water that splashes up. So um, you need water in order to dissolve um, and erode that, that rock um, away. And so oftentimes the bottom of a sinkhole will be a, a large puddle or lake. 
Uh, luckily, no one was was hurt um, or much damage besides what you can see um, in this instance. Um, so let's watch this video now to learn a little bit more about natural as well as um, human-caused sinkholes. Most natural sinkholes occur in areas with large deposits of carbonate rocks like limestone. Over long periods of time, groundwater flowing through the subsurface can dissolve this rock, creating voids and open tunnels. In fact, this is how most caves are formed. These tunnels and voids create a significant change in the character of groundwater flow. First, they allow water to flow quickly, just like it would through a pipe, making it more erosive. Secondly, they create a space for soil to wash away into. With those two conditions, any soil overlying a dissolution feature runs the risk of eroding away from the inside, eventually leading to a sinkhole. But not every sinkhole is formed through natural processes. In fact, many of the most famous sinkholes in recent times have been human created. Just like a cave dissolved into the bedrock can act like a pipe and allow groundwater to carry away soil, an actual pipe can do the same thing. And actual pipes aren't limited to areas with specific geology. If you could take a look into the subsurface of any urban area, you'd see miles and miles of water, sewer, and stormwater drainage pipes. Unfortunately, we can't see into the ground, so I built this demonstration so we can see for ourselves how this works. All it takes is a little bit of settlement or shifting to create an opening in one of these pipes and allow internal erosion to start. I added a gap in my pipe to simulate this effect. Water moving through this pipe is able to dislodge the adjacent soil and carry it away. Notice there's no signal on the surface that anything is awry. As more soils washed away, the subsurface void grows. Depending on all those soil properties we talked about earlier, this process can take days to years before anyone notices. Many of our subsurface utilities are placed directly below roadways, and the paving often acts as a final bridge above the sinkhole, hiding the void below. It's only a matter of time before everything above is swallowed up. Yeah, so those are sinkholes, uh, and they can be a major problem, um, especially in areas with a lot of um, calcite um, and limestone deposits, um, as well as areas that um, don't frequently check their uh, pipe systems. And so we'll talk about that in the context of um, landscape evolution um, in the next video. But first, uh, let's take a short break, and I'll see you guys in a little bit. All right, see you guys soon.